everyone. I'm Mark Idelson from Africa Business School. And today I'm going to talk to you about doing social network analysis of X culture data. So first of all, thank you for staying. Uh, I know that uh, this presentation should have happened during the hackathon, but unfortunately it, it, uh, we didn't manage to schedule it. So here we go. So first of all, we're going to look at the X culture records. So let's go over the entities and relationship in X culture data. So essentially entities are objects or subjects that exist on their own. And relationships will be things that tie these subjects and objects together in an action, in a relationship, with each having a specific role. So the first entity, of course, we have are the individual participants in X culture. We also have, of course, other individuals, which are the instructors. At the institutional level, we have the participants' institutions, which are mostly schools, as you all know. We also have the institutions served by X culture, mostly for profit companies, but there are some that have a different status. So let's just call them the served institutions. In other words, the recipients of the team reports and the ones who offer the challenges on the X culture platform every semester. Finally, between these micro individuals uh, and macro institutions, we have some meso entities, which are more uh, fleeting in nature. There are the cohorts that are organized four times a year now. There are the teams within these cohorts. And of course, there are the reports produced by the teams. And finally, there's another role that uh, I'm not going to explore very much because it hasn't been uh, completely uh, institutionalized yet. It's the roles of individuals who are past participants who are not act as coaches. But I'm just mentioning them here because they are another role for individuals, so they're another entity. But I'm not going to elaborate any further at this stage. So here are all the entities. And now let's move on to the relationships. So first of all, individual participants study in a given country. This country of study operates within a time zone. And sometimes during, during a specific exercise, that time zone may change in the middle of the semester. Secondly, they have a home country. And thirdly, they have a country of origin. Individual participants may be enrolled by individual instructors. As you know, in the case of uh, X Culture Academy, there is no instructor, it's just directly the participants enrolled. There are also other cases such as uh, individual consultants who participate in X culture too. And of course, the instructors are also located in a given country. Individual instructors may be affiliated or not with participant institutions. And participant institutions are also located in the country, but it's not necessarily the country where the individual instructors are located or the country where the individual participants enrolled by the individual instructors are studying. Individual participants are placed within teams, within cohorts, and teams may produce no, no report or one report. And the report is intended for a third institution, which itself is located in a a country or headquartered in a country, and the report targets another country or, or occasionally a larger region. So there, you could say there's a top country in that region. And this is always, of course, a country distinct from the served institution's country of location. There, and that more or less are all the st static relationships we find in X culture. So let, I will need now a bigger board.
to, to pursue. And now we're going to look at the various assessments that are made by individual participants, first of all, of their team. So in that particular relationship, we have uh, a participant assessing a team and doing it in several weeks of the X-Culture exercise. We also have participants self-assessing themselves. So in that case, there is a dual role of assessed and assessor combined. And of course, this also happens every week. Finally, there are peer assessments, which is a third relationship. And here, uh, there's, of course, distinct, distinct students that are assessed and being uh, and assessing. And that also happens every week. Finally, we have an end of exercise assessment of the report by every instructor who has a student who's a co-author of the report. And later, some served institutions also give an assessment of some of the reports they receive but well after the semester is over, as I'm sure you already know. So there are five assessment relationships conceptually in X culture data. Now, this is the conceptual or logical entity relationship schema. In practice, some of these objects are folded together in a single table. So the teams and their report output belong in a single table. The assessment of team and self are folded into a single table. And uh, any relationship, the institutions, schools, and companies can also be folded in a single table. And uh, the relationships that are not many to many do not create a new table. Now, in terms of physical schema, Justin, of course, introduced us to the system of record gathered from the survey collection. Uh, I just introduced what would be the OLTP relational schema of a physical database, but there are other forms of database that are also possible, but I won't go into them today because they're a little out of the scope of our discussion. There. So now let's move on to how social network analysis can bring more modeling of the phenomena we are observing in X-Culture exercises. So far, X-Culture data has mostly been mined by taking individual variables, producing team-level aggregates like gender distribution or uh, uh, time zone diversity, and so on and so forth, and also uh, looking at uh, team variables such as uh, quality of the report produced, overall creativity, uh, creativity of the, the report, and so on and so forth. And so what social network analysis brings are new types of network variables that can uh, explain phenomena not yet explained by the traditional approach to experimenting with uh, the X culture exercise and data. So typically, you, you find uh, three levels of uh, network data. You have uh, network data that is related to dyads. So in other words, to a relationship level aggregate, such as uh, assessed and assessor, that would constitute a dyad. You can also find uh, triad variables. So for example, when you have uh, three team members, they constitute a triad. And there are techniques in social network analysis that enable us to, to, uh, to understand whether a particular relationship is transitive or not, and so on and so forth. 
There are team level variables of a network nature, like the density of communication, like the, the fractiousness of the negative relationships within team. And also there are uh, inferred individual role variables that we can, uh, that we can uh, aggregate. And uh, they can have a predictive power on team variables combined, of course, with individual variables and team level aggregates. So the first experiment I did is based on three cohorts wherein uh, X culture asked uh, students if they would like to vote to exclude a team member. So this is a typical negative relationship. And only three of the past 24 sessions actually had this feature. These are actually all the teams of these three cohorts. There were 900 or so teams. And uh, of course, it's not really legible uh, there, but uh, uh, what you can see is that most of them are just had dots. And those are the, the teams where nobody voted anyone out. Let's zoom in on some of these teams. So starting from the left, in the first team, which has five members, the yellow dot in the center represents the team. So that's why it's of a different color. Well, in this first team, uh, nobody voted anyone out. In the second team, on the other hand, this one here, member five voted four other members out, and in some cases repeatedly. The size of the red circle is a representation of the number of exclusion votes received. And the arrow represents who voted whom out. So as you can see uh, in the case, in this second case, one person was dissatisfied with four other people. In my third example here, to the right, we have many more exclusion votes. In fact, everyone excluded, uh, tried to exclude someone except for uh, team member eight. Now, obviously, uh, this was a particularly fractious team. And in some cases, there was mutual exclusion votes, as can be seen by, for example, the double arrow here. Here are three other examples of teams from the same uh, 900, uh, 900 or so teams. And as you can see here, something different is happening from what happened in the three previous teams. Uh, in, the, in the team to the left, you basically had three people voting to vote three other people out. In the, in the middle team, you had a similar situation with uh, less uh, consensus, you might say, where three team members were voted out several times by five other teams. And finally, in the last one here, we had uh, two team members voting to exclude six other team members in an eight member team. So I won't go into the detail now about what the different uh, metrics here, network metrics signify. I'm sure that uh, when we have Q&A, we will, we will be uh, delving deeper into that. But what I want to illustrate here is that without a social network perspective, it would be very hard to get a handle on this kind of phenomenon within X culture teams. So here is an overall view of uh, this first uh, study, which was conducted in 2018 and presented at the uh, uh, Sunbelt of uh, the Sunbet Conference in 2019, there were 801 teams, including seven teams with one participant. So uh, these are obviously excluded from any network study. And uh, the most numerous teams had six members. 
So typically when we do social network analysis, we would focus on teams of the same size. So we take the more numerous because network metrics can be tricky to compare across different team sizes. And uh, what, we, what we notice here in, in the bottom is uh, that for negative tie analysis, such as an exclusion vote, uh, we need to, to, uh, to define new metrics because the metrics that relate to positive tie networks don't make sense, uh, semantically speaking. And once again, if in Q&A, we can delve deeper into this. So what we proposed in this uh, conference paper, which will soon be submitted to a journal, is new, uh, new uh, metrological contributions, and notably of network fractiousness and network fissures, which represent two different kinds of uh, splits within teams. Uh, one being a symmetrical phenomenon, and the other being asymmetrical. There are practical implications to, to, to this. Uh, and here is one that I've already shared in a public conference that you can find on YouTube. And uh, this is about uh, working from home practical implications. As you know, one thing that uh, managers need to learn to do is how to lead from home. And so what you need is uh, techniques comparable to uh, managing by wandering around without leaving your home. And so if you have a situation like the, the first team I, 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 I illustrated uh, this with, uh, well, uh, one person voting one person out over the eight weeks of where that was possible to, to vote for exclusion, uh, you can basically say all is well. Okay, one, one incident one week is nothing to, to worry about. In the second case, uh, when we have one person wishing to vote repeatedly for other people, network data will only go so far. What you need to do here is investigate. It's impossible to say just from network data what's going on exactly. And so my recommendation when you uh, detect something like this is to ever interview everyone individually to understand what the situation is. Perhaps uh, there is blame that falls on uh, member five of the team, perhaps members four, three, six, and seven are harassing member five. There's no way to tell. Perhaps there's some other explanation for this rift, but network data alone, of course, will not give you enough context to draw any uh, definitive conclusion. In the case, of uh, the three examples I showed you earlier, we clearly have two cliques, eight, four, and five on the one hand, and two, seven, and three on the other. So here you can save yourself some time and interview the two groups separately to understand what's going on and hopefully find a, a resolution to the situation as a manager. And finally, in the last example, well, here you have, to, you have to go more into remedial mode than preventative mode. Uh, and you first have to isolate this team from any proximate teams to make sure that whatever uh, negative energy is uh, sparking in this team doesn't propagate to the rest of the organization. So just as you would if you had a contact case with a virus, I, I suggest you isolate this team to prevent burnout from spreading, and then try and uh, investigate and diffuse the situation. So in, in the second experiment, uh, which was presented last year at Sunbelt, uh, what we did is we looked at, uh, uh, we, we looked at the, uh, a multi-level analysis of time zones, cultural attitudes, communication patterns, and uh, leader-follower relationships. And uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a lot of data on how uh, 
global virtual teams operate from a social network behavior perspective. And time is often neglected in international business research as the, the call of papers from 2020 from the Journal of World Business illustrates. So we came up with three hypotheses uh, based on uh, structural holes, which is a particular, uh, a particular perspective on uh, broker behavior within, social, within a social network analysis perspective. So we inferred that cultural structural holes could predict the assignment of leadership roles in global virtual teams, that temporal structural holes would moderate the leader's plural or singular effectiveness, and finally, that the work relationship structural holes would have a curvilinear linear effect on team task performance. And uh, in this particular cohort, we had 924 teams, and the most uh, numerous teams actually had only four members. There were 536 of these. I'll spare you the details of the other uh, statistics within these 536 teams. Um, suffice it to say that, uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, not everyone fills in every survey in X culture. Out of the 536 teams, we of course had 536 teams with information on the country of study of every participant, but we didn't have uh, 536 teams with complete data about cultural attitudes, about leadership follower relationships, or about communication patterns. In fact, out of the 536, only 216 teams had complete data across these four levels of analysis. And uh, they're all illustrated uh, below. Of course, it's impossible to read on the slide, but uh, here are zooms into uh, five of these teams. So the first, when we talk about multi-level network analysis here, we're talking about for the same team members showing the different the different uh, patterns between leader follower in the top row, communication frequency in the middle row, cultural propinquity in the third row, and temporal propinquity in the final row. And here is uh, us uh, fooling around with different ways to represent the same information. So putting the information about all four levels into a single chart. So uh, the time zone uh, was coded by a color for each node. The score of the node is actually the leader status or follower status. So the higher the score, the more likely the, the team member is in a leadership role. Uh, the, then the, the ties between nodes are the communication patterns. And what, it, what you can see here is that uh, although this should be a symmetric relationship, because it's about communication frequency, often uh, respondents don't state the same answer. So one, uh, for example, if I take uh, these two, they agree that they communicated frequently. And these two, they communicated infrequently. But uh, these two disagree. One of them says, this is the person I communicate the most with. 
And the other says, this is the one I communicated frequently with. So it's very important in network data to get ideally 100% of respondents when the relationship is asymmetrical. And when the relationship is symmetrical, you can, you can have uh, all respondents but one and uh, consider you have a, a, a complete data set. But if you have less than that, it's not like in traditional statistics where you, the law of big numbers operates. You can have a single respondent not answer you, and it completely changes the topology of the network, the shape it has. So these are the variables and uh, measures we, we were looking at in this study. Uh, network level, node level, or uh, individual level if you prefer, and some control variables. Uh, once again, I won't go into the details today. The, there'll be an asynchronous Q&A as, as you know about this. Finally, let me just quickly talk about the uh, other experiments I'm, I'm conducting. So uh, in 2019, I also launched with people from the University of Leeds and Renmin University, a shared leadership study, which is still ongoing. And of course, at the hackathon this year, we started uh, exploring gender relationships from a social network perspective within X culture. And uh, we're going, and we've started designing a, a new survey to look at relational energy and that how that affects notably creativity. So we're looking at uh, uh, the level of energy when uh, participants join X culture before they're put into teams. We're looking at flows of energies between teams, and we're looking at uh, team outputs the resulting team outputs, and probably some individual outputs too, like uh, satisfaction with participation in X culture and so on and so forth. So there, here are a few uh, takeaways. So every time you're manipulating a relationship between social constructs, and a social con construct can be smaller than micro, it can be, uh, I guess nano, you can do networks of thoughts, networks of meanings. So things that are within uh, cognition, human cognition, you can take uh, a speech and every sentence has a verb and a subject and sometimes objects and adverbs and so on. So every time you have a verb, you're, you, you have a tie, you have a relationship. And the subjects and the objects and uh, the adverbs sometimes can also be roles in that relationship. So you've all been doing a social network without knowing it. And more broadly, at the macro level, you can do social network analysis between countries. If you look, say, at uh, FDI flows, that's a network of foreign direct investment flows. So it lends itself quite easily to a social network analysis. Here are a few online references you can go to if you want to learn more about SNA from a more generic perspective. Thank you, everyone, for staying until the end. And I look forward to your questions and queries online.